This lecture will cover chapters 14, 15, and 16 in the Gambrel text social work practice. This, um, this collection of chapters looks at varying uh, issues related to engaging clients effectively in the treatment relationship and in dealing with difficult situations as well that may occur from time to time uh, in our work with other people and in the work setting itself. This uh, really kind of goes along pretty well with the contextual approach to our social work practice because engaging the client as a partner in the practice is a part of the contextual philosophy of, of uh, treatment. The contextual approach really also requires that we attend to personal and environmental factors that include uh, or rather that influence our client's participation. And, and although sometimes we blame the client for not participating, not cooperating, not being motivated. A lot of times there are factors in the relationship between the client and the worker or the worker's agency uh, or influences from outside the, in the client's social system, but outside the treatment relationship that, that has an impact on, on those, uh, on that, on that uh, participation level. So it's important that we really kind of take a look at the entire environmental uh, picture when we're when we're considering if what what's going on if a client isn't participating with this fully and when the client doesn't participate we should also be taking this as an occasion to examine what can be done to improve that relationship and that may mean changing our own approach to how we how we work with a client not only in terms of our the goals perhaps and um, the objectives that we're setting forth for for intervention but also in how we go about interacting the skills that we use or don't use in interacting with with our client sometimes all of this also has to do with the agency setting and the type of work that the that the uh, social worker is doing you know for instance in child protection or in prison settings and things like that uh, but also in even in voluntary settings uh, settings that are say more positive and and something that the client where the client seeks out services sometimes it is also a matter of the of the worker's skills in engaging the client and and in communicating effectively that need to be need to be looked at non-voluntary clients as i've said a number of times in in our talks during the semester non-voluntary clients can be brought into the treatment and uh, social work process and become voluntary, become willing participants as well through the use of effective skills in engaging those clients. We already have talked about some of those, um, some such as solution focused uh, interventions and those kinds of things that have a, a very, uh, very positive way of engaging clients as well as uh, motivational interviewing skills and those kinds of things that, that can uh, help to engage a client through helping the client, bringing the client to recognize the discrepancies between the client's thoughts and uh, feelings and the client's actions. So we don't, we shouldn't uh, just reach the conclusion that involuntary clients aren't going to participate or um, that um, we have to do some kind of trickery to get them engaged in, in work or that we have to pursue unethical goals in order to engage them as well. Those things are simply not, not necessary, not true. Gambrel talks about there being two different kinds of resistance and, and one is the resistance to the process where the, the client just really is unwilling to engage in the work that he or she has to do in order to obtain the outcomes and that could be just an overall resistance to working with social workers in general or or to uh, to um, you know agreeing to work with individuals in various agencies that maybe you encounter clients with. The other kind of resistance is known as outcome resistance, and this refers to um, the benefits of the, of, of uh, the problem behaviors. So sometimes the behaviors that the client's engaged in have a payoff that if um, we, you know, we are successful in helping the client cease those behaviors, they no longer get those rewards. And of course, the, one of the most obvious um, behaviors in this in this consideration is substance abuse and the fact that you know the the addiction is uh, something that demands to be satisfied and and when you when you have a substance abusing client and you require that individual to cease abusing substances in order to have their children back or in order to 
do whatever they're they want to do um, they're, they're really having to give up something that has a, a, a very large payoff for them and so that's where outcome resistance can sometimes come into play with those kinds of things and so so really when you're when you're beginning to engage clients you know they talk about a cost benefit analysis you know what it is that the client is getting through the, these behaviors uh, through these um, you know through through um, the activities that he, that he or she is doing that's that's led that person to your doorstep what's that person getting from that and and what's the cost of giving that up and how can you balance that out with the benefits how can you show them that person that the benefits of of altering their behaviors is greater than the cost in giving it up it's a tough thing to do i think about a a family that i encountered very early in my career in fact in child protection in central florida with a a young 22 year old mother that have had five children already she had I think one set of twins, but but had four uh, births uh, from the time that she married this uh, this guy when she was I think 16 years old, if I remember correctly. In in this particular case, we're really talking about process resistance here because she wanted when I made the home visits. Uh, generally speaking, during the day the the uh, father in the family was away at work. I talked with the mother. Um, the children were very seriously neglected, and in fact, it um, ultimately had their, they had to be removed because um, the infant was really beginning to show signs of malnutrition. But in the process of trying to get the mom to cooperate, we tried to get her to go to the health, uh, the uh, public health center, to have the children, you know, have their health assessed and those kinds of things, and. Um, although she would agree to do that, she wouldn't follow through and found out that her husband was very upset with my intervention. While he didn't want to be there to talk to me um, about about what, what we were trying to accomplish, um, he was very upset about the fact there was another male, as far as he was concerned, telling his, his wife what to do. You know, And so that was something that at the time I didn't recognize until quite late in the, the uh, interaction. In fact, it was right after the removal when that finally came out and uh, I understood what was going on and it was a very difficult process going through the court he had a lot of hostility towards me that uh, he expressed it was one of the few times in the in the field in fact where I felt physically threatened at one point by him but but uh, all worked out well and I managed to talk my way out of the situation but uh, anyway it's an example of process resistance where uh, I think he would agree that, that with the goal that we had, and certainly his his wife agreed that we wanted the children to grow up healthy. Um, he didn't like the way we were going to go about getting there, but he didn't have any other solutions to um, you know to it. And in fact, wasn't engaging in in the in the intervention process at all, which of course made it even more difficult. Change is hard, and and uh, you know there's a lot of uh, a lot of effort involved for the client and change and there's a lot of pain involved in that as well and so there were sometimes the reluctance to go forward with change um, is, is, is relates to the fact that it's just tough to give up these behaviors and and creates some of the problems for themselves but also for other people I think I think uh, this young mom you know I think she really wanted to follow through with things and she was concerned about the baby but uh, she was really concerned about what was going to happen, how that would impact her relationship with her husband and what he would think of it. And I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if there wasn't uh, some abusive aspects in, in that relationship. They weren't evident at the time, but um, she had a lot of reasons why to worry about, about change being on the horizon. So, in, in, and, you know, in terms of trying to establish a relationship, the Gambrel points out also that uh, sometimes, you know, clients just have poor relationship skills or they've had such terrible experiences in the past, uh, not only with, uh, well, with position, persons in positions of authority, for instance, but also just other significant others in their lives that, uh, that, that uh, through the process of transference could really intrude upon your own relationship, your attempts to build a relationship with them. There's there's always a reason why they're resisting, as this slide points out. You know, so um, you know there there are things you need to do, and and one of them is is try to get to the root of what that resistance is all about, and and um, you know 
use a lot of empathy. Don't don't try to persuade as as in those kinds of things, and and you'll be likely be more successful in engaging the client. And and you know again a lot of the these kind of social and personal factors really have more to do with um, um, the the establishment of that relationship. Once you get over that hump, I mean it, they they have less to do with it in the later phases of treatment. Um, and and I think there are other other processes that come in later in treatment, later in the in the uh, change process that uh, explain resistance from the client. But, but early in the, in the intervention, a lot of times it has to do with these personal factors. So, you know, we, we have to emphasize the benefits of change, you know, make the, the, well, make the benefit worth more than the cost of, of giving up the problem behaviors. And then when, when uh, the, the clients begin to, to engage in, in those desired behaviors, of course, we support them and uh, heavily praise and, and support those, uh, those kinds of behaviors that we want. Um, your skill in encouraging your client to believe that the methods to be used are effective have a lot to do with that and there are there are certain factors associated with this you know one of them is always focus on outcomes that are important to the client you're more likely to engage them if they see value in you know in in change um, sometimes with people who are reluctant or resistant um, look for some concrete things you can do to to sort of get your foot in the door with them and convince them that you're here to help um, I can another another protective services case that I worked again many years ago in Central Florida, um, and and I I don't really remember the specific things, but I know I think that I think the there was a mom with four little boys, and and we were able to keep these. Well, actually, we did have to remove those children too, but we were able to return them uh, in fairly short order. And in in the process of of uh, getting the mom involved with us, you know. I helped her get get uh, deal with uh, the light company and I get some uh, kind of basic needs taken care of in, in her home I, and I don't remember specifically what it was anymore but I know that that really dealing with those things that meant something to her in the here and now uh, can I think convinced her that I was I was here to help and went a long way to get her in, uh, working on other issues that she needed to work on so we could get those boys back with her and uh, the return wasn't was not too long after removal, and I, as far as I know, that was the last removal that had to happen for those for that family. It worked out pretty well. Um, what uh, you know, you want to anticipate um, their hesitation and, and prepare for it. You know, um, what's the likelihood of change and what's going to be involved in that? Um, that's something that they're going to be very concerned about. They're going to hesitate about confidentiality and. Uh, whether or not they can trust you to, you know, enough that they can tell you things that they don't tell other people and be honest with you about certain things. Uh, how much time is going to be involved? What are the costs, both both monetarily as well as socially, let's say, and, you know, in, in putting forth all that effort? They're going to be hesitant about, uh, well, their beliefs about their behavior and, and, and its causes and, and uh you know whether or not they can actually uh, they can actually change themselves. They worry about being judged by you. They they're hesitant because they see differences between you and themselves as well. So, a lot of different kinds of things like this. Uh, class differences is mentioned. You know that that uh, individuals sometimes if you come from, um, you know, a, a, most of us do I think from a, a pretty middle class kind of existence at least. You know, and uh, when we work with families that are you know in the lower socioeconomic rung, the latter a lot of times they they do feel very much as though they're being judged because generally society does that. And and um, so your approach to them, you know, one of the things you want to do is to, I think, you know, at some point, perhaps you may have to acknowledge that concern or, or ask them to talk with you a little bit about what they think, um, you know, about your intervention and, um, you know, what they assume you believe about them, perhaps. Um, I, I, I don't know, you know, but I think that, that the idea about these class differences is something that needs to be addressed in, the, in, in that relationship also at times in order to get them engaged with you. Keeping in mind the stages of change that we've talked about in previous, uh, previous lectures and is an important thing here as well, you know, that you want to take a look at where that uh, where that individual is in the 
pre-contemplation contemplation kind of uh, process you know because if you're trying to get them engaged in in uh, activities before they're convinced there's even a problem you're going to have a lot more resistance to things so design your intervention with their with their stage of change in mind always focus on the client's strengths and and also if there's a coercive nature to the relationship as there is like you know in, in some of the things that we do uh, I, I think you should talk about that also with them and you know acknowledge that it exists and and um, try to find some ways to um, de-emphasize the coercive nature of, of that of that uh, professional intervention and engage the engage the client in a cooperative relationship with you if at all possible Hepworth talks about about relationship skills and gamble gambrel and, and uh, we're going to cover that in and uh, separately in the Hepworth the lecture in the Hepworth chapters but uh, gambrel talks about the different things you can do that that uh, will in, increase client participation so for, for instance be careful about your mannerisms your style of questions um, open-ended versus closed questions so, and, and we're going to talk more about questioning here in a little bit your attending skills you know paying attention um, perhaps leaning forward you know I actually and I think one of the slides the slides actually later on does say something about you know sitting back uh, with particularly sometimes like with um, younger clients I, I think adolescent clients sometimes you know if now you have to picture the, the arrangement of the office and so I, I don't have a desk sitting between me and the client and the clients kind of sitting to my side and I'm turned around in my chair with the desk behind me but you know sometimes um, this is a little out of the, what the, the the book on interviewing would tell you to do but you know I found that sometimes you know being able to just to sit back and put your put my feet up on the desk or on the, on the table when I'm talking with the, with the adolescent client is something to kind of help put them at ease as well you know it's more relaxed and casual which is the thing that you know a teenage client often wants from you now with an adult you know uh, particularly one who isn't you know in the early stages of the intervention and somebody who's you know not comfortable with you or may have some resistance and uh, feel they're being judged that could communicate very different things to that person watch out always watch out for the effects of transference tra transference on their on the relationship with you you know uh, if you're finding an awful lot of resistance and and rejection for things you know there's very possible that there's things that are going on inside the clients um, reactions to you that relate to other people in their lives position in positions of authority or older males or older females or whatever it might be and so just keep that in mind and you might you might probe and explore a little bit around that you know without you know you don't want to uh, do too many interpretations early on but for your own good it might be worth uh, worth knowing more about about what what might be happening there when the client is silent with you uh, well, first of all, there's nothing wrong with silences, and I think uh, sometimes social workers have more of a problem, therapists, if you're talking about a therapy relationship, have more of a problem with silence than the client does, and, and uh, sometimes it's okay to just let silence happen. Uh, there may be all sorts of things going on, but, but uh, it's also a good idea to explore that silence and see if you can find out what it means, you know, is the client... Uh, uh, too angry is the client very tearful uh, you know what what kinds of things is going on that that might be behind that silence it's a it's a good thing to explore um, encourage your clients to um, talk with uh, different kinds of skills that you might use like active listening looking for suggestions uh, always always try to avoid criticizing the client um, Predicting reluctance to disclose something, I I, I had a um, um, and kind of an arrogant adolescent in a group setting that was uh, when I worked at the mental health center that was sent to me for treatment, and he he um, you know he told me right away he he wasn't going to work with me, he didn't want to be there. His social worker made him come see me, and uh, he was going to come because he had to come or he get in trouble with the facility where he was, but he wasn't going to talk to me. And that's just the way it was, and and um, I, you know, I told him, well, I, I, if I were in your shoes, I probably wouldn't want to talk to me either. I mean, you know, who, why should I think that you would want to trust me? And 
uh, if if I were in your shoes, I wouldn't trust me either. And and so I've just you know come and if you want to be quiet, be quiet, and we'll find some other things to do. And and um, I let his, I let his worker know what I was going on. She didn't understand it and was a little upset about it. But you know, I was really kind of turning control of this over to him, and which is what he needed at the time. And it wasn't long before he began to start offering things up. And I, I seem to recall that I even discouraged him at one point, for, uh, one or two points, of, from telling me too much. You know, because it's probably too early for you to be telling me this stuff just yet. You know, give yourself some more time. Make sure you want to tell me these things. And and. Um, it wound up being a good relationship in the end, you know, but I uh, I just chose not to struggle with him about that and, and kind of predicting that reluctance to disclose and supporting his right to stay quiet, I think meant a lot to him. And sometimes that works. It's 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 a kind of what they call a paradoxical intervention, you know, where you sort of prescribe the problem behavior and the client doesn't know if it's a if it's a reluctant client, the client doesn't know quite what to do. It's a, it's kind of a it's kind of a cool technique. Uh, in in, ther in uh, therapeutic relationships, but something you you, you want to use very sparingly. And you can see there's a, a number of other things to engage participation. You know, requesting work from the client, give them homework assignments or have them do some things in session, try to do some concrete things in session. Whether, you know, I for one, I'm not a big one on role play, but it might be role plays or, you know, or, you know, talking to the empty chair or different kinds of things that you can do that might get the client active. Um, sometimes it, uh, with, with younger kids in particular, you know, games, you know, there's all sorts of therapeutic games out there that you can use that kind of help the client open up a little and things like that. Um, be dependable, be clear in your motives, you know, that that uh, you become more credible if, if, if you're predictable and, and trustworthy in that respect. Uh, try not to ever blame the client for things that are going on. Um, and also it talks about, um, oh, partialization. You know, uh, our clients come to us overwhelmed with their problems a lot of times and and uh, you know it's just sort of this big mass of things that they don't know where to start to, to fix things and and you can help your client um, become more effective in solving problems by teaching them how to partialize their problems breaking down those big problems into smaller manageable steps now that in in fact is one of the things that case uh, planning does you know that that case plans um, treatment plans whatever, whatever you want to call it uh, you know you have goals and you have activities sometimes you have objectives above the goals sometimes you don't but but it takes these big things and it breaks it down into smaller things and and uh, then as the client achieves those smaller things they become they begin to feel more effective more their self-efficacy increases and, and uh, they begin to feel that they can begin to tackle other problems as well on their own and that's what you want to do is teach them how to break these things down into manageable units rather than allowing themselves to be overwhelmed with this uh, huge issue this huge problem formal client feedback is another thing you know they I think it's Gambrel, maybe it's Hepworth, I don't know, but in one of these books they actually talk about at the end of every session giving the client a, a, a short survey and say, you know, just ask them three or four questions. I found today's session helpful. I thought the, ther the therapist or the worker understood me, you know, um, you know, I look forward to meeting with the worker again, you know, that kind of thing. Just some, you know, three or four basic questions that allows the client to give you feedback about whether or not the the session was the meeting whatever you want to call it was was seen as useful S some clients won't feel comfortable enough to be honest with you others will but what it does is again it 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 uh, conveys the sense to your client that you want to know what they're thinking about what you're doing and you and that you really want to help them um, you want to please them essentially with your intervention something to think about Gabriel says, helpers reinforce some behaviors, ignore others, and punish still others. In turn, clients influence the helper's behavior. The quality of your communication skills influences client options. Now, I, I talked about, um, that says 1957. Um, I talked about Carl Rogers uh, earlier in the semester, and I don't want to overemphasize, but Gabriel brings him up, and so it gives me a little license 
to talk about him a little more. Obviously, I, I really liked Carl Rogers' uh, philosophy and his approach to working with people. And uh, he was uh, a psychotherapist. And honestly, I'm not positive of what, what f specific field his training was in, whether it's psychology or psychiatry. I don't think he was a doctor, a psychiatrist. But um, in any event, you know, he was a very famous therapist, became very famous in the late 50s and early 60s. And, and um, perhaps you've seen an old, old film, probably not shown it anymore, called Three Therapists. And there was a client named Gloria who was uh, given to three different therapists, popular therapists at the time, so you could demonstrate her talking about her problem with three therapists using three different techniques and there was Albert Ellis with Rational Emotive Therapy, there was Fritz Perls with Gestalt Therapy, and there was Carl Rogers with, uh, Ro well, Rogerian Intervention or whatever. And and I can remember that uh, uh, Gloria, of, of the three therapists, of course, Gloria found um, Carl, Carl Rogers to be the warmest and, and that's part of his trademark and at one point said it was like talking to her grandfather and that is kind of the way Carl Rogers was and he had three conditions that he believed that was was necessary and sufficient conditions for therapeutic change and that was genuineness or I think he I think he referred to it as congenuous but Gambrel kind of goofs this up a little bit and, and brings in some other terms that makes it a little less clear but congruence or genuineness positive regard non-possessive warmth and empathy and so rogers believed that if you can convey those three things in in your relationship and now he was talking about therapy um and the book is written for therapists. I think I told you I read it in my senior year in college and found it to be a personal self-help book as well. And uh, really, really, that book was so important in, in helping me get on my feet as I left school, I think. And and uh, also gave me some, some I think, a good foundation for uh, approaching clients also. I uh, wish I could say I was good at what he did but uh but in any event I, you know it's one of those things you try to do as good as you can and um i i recommend the book to you again i i already did earlier and i mentioned it later in these slides as well but um um his um he he believed that you have those three those three conditions in the relationship whatever your relationship with, is with your client you're going to see change gambrel says well she brings respect into this as well. And she says, you know, uh, effective relationship skills that communicate respect and understanding, even when the client is angry and is criticizing you as to your effectiveness with the client. You do get clients that challenge you sometimes that are disappointed with you or uh, angry with you, expect, uh, you know, expect uh, change to happen more rapidly because you're, you know, you're using your professional skills or whatever and uh, um, maintaining your own uh, respect and, and uh, being able to empathize with the client through all of that is something that will add to our effectiveness. And and there's a quote here about the importance of relationship factors, talking about research that shows that non-professionals are as effective as those with professional degrees, training, and experience in helping clients. The point here is that there are studies that support the fact, that support the notion that your relationship with your client is more important than any technique you use in, in intervening with a client. There are other variables that are mentioned here that have a, are said to have a positive impact on outcome, that things like your credibility, empathic understanding, your ability to affirm the client, you know, a positive positive feedback to the client, uh, acknowledging the client's feelings, uh, expressing understanding of the client's position on things, uh, your skill in engaging the client with all of these kinds of things we're talking about, that you maintain your focus on client concerns, even even in the face of, of say, criticism and anger on the part of the client, and, and your skill in directing the client's attention to his or her feelings uh, in, in those circumstances. Now, again, the, the text says about this debate about what's more important, those non-specific factors, and that is the relationship we're talking about, the, the, the therapeutic alliance, whatever, and the helping, and, uh, the helping skills that are used 
and the person of him or himself or herself blah non-specific versus specific interventions you know and what is it the relationship um, and the person or is it the intervention the specific intervention that is used the type of intervention and there's a debate about what's more important there are people that would argue both either side but there was a study in 2001 whose conclusion said that a preponderance of evidence indicates that there are large therapist effects and that the effects greatly exceed treatment efforts again this is talking about a therapist, but you can put social worker in there. I mean, this is not just about a therapy. The study may have been about the relationships in a therapeutic relationship between a social worker, a clinical social worker and a client or a psychologist and a client. But this can apply in any social work intervention that you're having, where you're, especially ones where you're going to continue to see this client over a period of time. So when they talk about therapist effects, let's just say worker effects. Um, and again, the relationship here, according to Wampold, um, the studies indicated that the relationship was more important than the, the treatment efforts that were used. And there are other studies that, that are cited in the Gambrel, Texas, as the therapeutic relationship variables correlate more highly with client outcome than specialized treatment techniques. Okay, enough said about that. I really do believe in the importance of, the, of a relationship with client. So what kind of skills can you use to encourage the engagement of the client and to have a successful interaction with clients? Well, first of all, be an attentive listener. Um, be physically and mentally ready to listen. Um, you know, wait, wait for um, others to complete their statements before speaking, for instance. That's one thing. Don't interrupt uh, your client when they're saying things, even though you may know right where they're going. Um, and, and you can... You can be an attentive listener by, uh, first of all, by the assumption of ignorance. You know, tell me more about things. Help me understand. Uh, sometimes you're going to be told you can't understand this situation because you haven't lived it or you're a guy or you're not old enough or you don't have children. And so you can't understand. And, and one, I think, very effective response to that is help me understand. Tell me about this. If, if, if you know, if that's true. I can learn about it from you and and there you're you're making the client the expert actually as well as being um, an ignorant learner so to speak um, keep in mind that your nonverbals are very important when you listen um, try to avoid giving advice uh, generally speaking now there are situations such as you know crisis uh, intervention those kinds of things where you may have to give direct advice but but in general try to try to avoid giving advice you know because it implies that you that you know and the client doesn't that you're that you know it's sort of patronizing to say i have a solution for you this is what you need to do don't use cliches, don't patronize, you know, oh, you'll get over it, don't worry, or this, this, this too shall pass, you know, that kind of thing. Don't parrot, you know, parroting is repeating back exactly what the person says to you. And uh, yeah, that can be effective sometimes in, in, you know, if you're doing using active listening skills to just kind of say the words back so that the client hears it. But if you do that over and over and over again, you know, that becomes, that becomes pretty irritating. <laughs> Uh, don't pretend to understand. If you don't understand, make sure that you tell the client that. Um, interpret interpretation of feelings. Um, the uh, Gambrel says, you know, and, and Hepworth is going to talk a lot about interpreting uh, things, but uh, Hepworth says, you know, there are times when we use interpretations to help us avoid listening. It's a poor substitute for listening. And and early, you don't want to use interpretations early in the relationship anyway, but uh, that, it's only after you've got an established relationship where you'd want to use that. And, but um, so ill-timed interpretation of feelings are a poor substitute for listening. Watch your mannerisms. Uh, and you know, this is one of those things, for instance, speaking of which, I know I say you know a lot when I'm talking, and and it is a, I, uh, I wish I had time to go back through all of my lectures and edit all of that stuff out, and I just I just don't have the opportunity to do that, and I know you you have to put up with that, but 
we all have these kind of little verbal ticks, let's say, that that we use sometimes. If you're listening to somebody and they're talking to you and want to encourage them to continue talking, you say, okay, 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 you know, and that that can get, be, again, you know, anything that you do repeatedly like that becomes very irritating and kind of off putish with people, as well as those kinds of behaviors like nodding your head or gesturing with your hands and those kinds of things. Nothing wrong with doing that occasionally, but doing it repeatedly over and over again becomes a kind of a cliche and and I think it turns people off. So, so Gambrel recommends, and I think other people who know about, about this process will tell you the same thing, that mixing paraphrasing, which is, you know, repeating the content of what the client says not not parroting necessarily but putting it in your words repeating the content that the client gives you uh, intellectually let's say the content mix that with the feelings that may be being expressed so reflecting feelings so mixing content paraphrasing with reflecting feelings might be some of the most effective ways you can respond mixing the two together How do you ask questions in a way that can be helpful? Because questions should be directing attention to what you believe is important. And so the questions that you ask really have some import. When you ask questions, generally, the best thing to do is to progress from general questions to the more specific questions and then maybe on to feelings so that so that you go a little deeper than content with those questions. So again, it depends on the, the, where you are in the relationship with your client. But the, the, I think the thing to take from this is start with the general, move more to specific questions if you have to. In um, forensic interviewing, for instance, where we're interviewing uh, young child victims of sexual abuse, one of the, the uh, hallmarks of that is moving from the general to the more specific because the less specific the question the less um, the the um, other side in a court hearing could say you were leading the child to to make the statements that the child made so when you ask general questions like you know then move into more specifics if if the if the child needs help in doing that um, then that's the process. You start from general, move to specific. Likewise, asking open-ended questions as much as possible, moving to more close-ended questions, even eventually yes, no questions if you have to. But the more you go into that end, the less you're going to encourage the client to talk and uh, the less certain it would be if you were in a situation where you, and you, a lot of your work won't be taking you into court, but if you were in a situation where you were going to court, um, the more open-ended, the more the, the more open-ended questions you get, the more content you're going to uh, get that is produced by the client and not something that someone else can say you led them to say. Questions should always be instrumental. That is that they should contribute to helping the client. There should be a purpose to your question, not just curiosity or general conversation. Um, and, and there are errors in questioning, leading questions where, you know, questions where you suggest the answer. That's at the end of this list, in fact. It's a bad question, bad, bad way to ask questions. Asking questions at the wrong time, asking too many closed-ended questions. There's a time and a place for closed-ended questions. But, but don't, don't uh, make it a habit of that's your style of questioning. Keep your questions relevant. Don't, they call it question stacking. Don't ask more questions more than one question at a time, that gets very confusing to clients. They don't know which one to answer. Don't ask complicated questions. And uh, maybe above all else, watch out for that word, why. Why did you do this? Why do you think this happened? You know, that implies blame and judgment. And, and it's a word that we want to try as much as possible to erase from our interviews if we can. Uh, Gambrel suggests the use of probes to clarify anything that's uh, ambiguous to you. Could you tell me more about this or what do you mean by that, that type of thing? So that um, it's sort of a general way of, of pushing forward with trying to get more specific content from a client. 
Confrontation is something, um, there are people who uh, who like to use confrontation with, especially with resistant clients, and uh, I always call it the jackhammer approach, you know, it, that the idea being that you're just going to bust right through this surface to get to the what's going on underneath, and it doesn't work very well, if at all, and, and uh, what you do is build up a lot of resistance and resentment if you, if you uh, confront in the wrong way. Now, confrontation can be a positive thing, and as Campbell points out, we have there are roles that require its use, effective use, and and when we don't do that, you know, we really um, we're undermining our our capacity to be successful with clients and to achieve the things we're supposed to achieve. So sometimes confrontation has its place, but confrontation doesn't have to be aggressive. Confrontation can be supportive. It can be empathic, in fact, or empathetic. I guess is the word some people prefer. Uh, negative feedback decreases risk taking and performance on the part of the client, and so we always have to be cautious, yeah, even when confronting, to try to try to make sure that that confrontation. While you want to be clear with what it is that you're telling the client, you want to put it in a way that they can hear it as much as possible. Remember, it's a basic communication, and a lot of the stuff in this these chapters are basic communication uh, tenets. You know, one of the basic communications is is that the speaker has to be responsible to bring the, his, his or her meaning across effectively to the listener. If the listener doesn't understand the speaker, if the listener is walled off because the listener is feeling like they have to defend themselves so they're not hearing what's being said, that's the speaker's doing, not the listener's doing. And so, so take responsibility for what you're communicating, communicating to the other person and always try to be sure that you're saying it in a way that that person can hear it. If you're confronting too heavily, uh, using ill-timed confrontations, too aggressive with it, whatever it might be, um, you're going you're gonna to generate a lot of defensive reactions. So try to be firm and supportive at the same time. And, and consider the client's readiness when you, when you go to confront uh, some resistance or some contradiction between the clients, like in motivational interviewing, between the client's thoughts and behaviors between the client's thoughts and behaviors, period, is what I mean. And again, with, with interpretations, avoid their overuse. Uh, don't interpret too early and too quickly because it really can imply that you're the person that understands what's really going on. And, you know, if, if uh, particularly if you're in a spot, if you are put yourself in the, in the client's position and you have somebody kind of guessing what's going on inside it, even if you're hitting it right. Um, yeah, if you're not ready to really kind of share these things that are going on underneath, you know, you're not sure of this, it's going to really make that person more reluctant to talk with you and, and uh, more resistant. So you don't want to do that too early. Self-disclosure is another, um, uh, another thing to consider. When do we talk about ourselves? And, and um, Gambrel kind, of, Gambrel kind of goes through this without really talking about boundaries a whole lot. And, and um, I think that, that the discussion of boundaries is something that's very important when we think about self-disclosure because it's very possible as you begin to disclose pieces of yourself that the relationship you have with your client changes in a way. Now, that doesn't have to be bad necessarily, but it's just very important for you to keep a grip on what you're disclosing and why it's being disclosed. Sometimes you disclose because the client asks you questions about yourself. And there are a lot of people who believe, well, some people at least who believe that, well, you shouldn't really answer those questions until you know why the client's asking you the question, what the meaning is of that. Personally, I've found, um, and yeah, personally, I, you know, I have found in in that discussion that sometimes just responding honestly is the thing that they need from you. And it doesn't really matter why they're asking as long as you know where your boundaries are. And and sometimes there are things that you're not going to respond to, you know, that you, and, and if you can't respond to those, if you're declining to self-disclose, as the slide says, you know, don't be nasty about it. Don't be brusque. Don't be. Uh, don't throw the questions back in some kind of condescending manner or whatever. Um, just uh, just tell them that those are things that really 
you know, you're not, you're not ready. To, you don't think it's appropriate to discuss with, with them or it's not important to their process, whatever it might be. Um, teenagers are particularly good at asking a lot of personal questions. Uh, as you try to explore what's going on with them, you know, they want you to tell them what's going on with you about those things. And that's not always the case that it's, that it's healthy at all. But uh, self-disclosure can be something that can be used to encourage your client to share information about themselves because it, it does, it gives them a sense that you're a human being, that you're, you're like them to, um, you know, and it also, as this slide suggests, you know, it, it reduces the appearance of aloofness, you know, that it, it kind of makes you kind of much more like them. And that's something that can encourage clients sometimes to, to relax with you. Uh, it's also very good at normalizing client concerns that when, you know, certain issues are going on and they have certain feelings to, you know, to be able to relate a little bit about how you've had similar experiences that have had similar feelings, you know, it kind of helps normalize things for them. But um, too much disclosure can create embarrassment or, or actually can kind of put the client in a position where they feel like they have to disclose when they don't want to. Um, but too, the too much disclosure, I think I said too little, too much disclosure can create that embarrassment. And too little disclosure um, really kind of, you know, keep, I think keeps the client at arm's length, which perhaps sometimes that's appropriate, but, but a lot of times it's not. Um, remember, though, that the purpose of self-disclosure is that it aids in the achievement of the client's goals. It has nothing to do with you. It's not about you. It's not about you making a connection with another person or anything like that. And that's another danger in self-disclosure. Um, must be kept connected to their service goals and, and always keeping boundaries in mind. And and also cultural differences should always be considered because self-disclosure is not something that's appropriate in some cultures. But, you know, sometimes I used to say that if I want my clients to share what's going on inside of them, uh, sometimes I have to kind of give them a little bit about what's going on inside of me. The other thing about self-disclosure, by the way, just going back to this slide, it's not just talking about things in your life and what you what you do or have done or what you think, but it's also about what's going on with you in, in during the process of, of interacting with the client, you know, so that you, you can be, that's the part of this genuineness, that you can be honest in, in saying how you're reacting to what the client is doing. It is always professional, though, always professional, but that you can share with the client how you're reacting to the client's statements or feelings or to the process in your relationship, you know, so so that um, you know when you're feeling happy about what happened you can tell them that or if you're disappointed um, with uh, with the content of uh, the meeting today that you're able to share that in an honest and respectful way that's self-disclosure also involves that it can go a long way to help the client in a relationship with you i want to spend a couple of slides uh, talking a little bit more about roger's three conditions um, i think actually gamperl goes into it more if I remember correctly. Um, and this comes from the book On Becoming a Person. Uh, the second edition, I guess, was, I think it had to be more than a second edition, was put out in 1995. And it's got a forward by somebody new. I haven't, I don't have that copy. I'm not even sure I have my old copy, although I can't imagine that I didn't keep it. I'll have to dig around my bookshelves a little. That's one of those books that I always wanted to keep may have loaned it out and never gotten it back. I have loaned it out a number of times. Um, this says 1961. I've seen other sources that said it was first written in 54. Some say 57. I think a previous slide say 57. It's an old book. It's been out there a long time. It's a classic. I really recommend you get it and read it. I, I, it doesn't matter, you know, how long ago it was written. The principles in that book, I think, are timeless. And I think they're good it's it's very good um, very good material for people that are going to be helping others now this particularly if you're going to be working in a therapy relationship with people someday but even if you're not doing that this is stuff that's really very very useful in working with with people so the first of the three conditions empathy defined as the sensitive ability and willingness to understand the client's thoughts feelings and struggles from the client's point of view. Now we know that we know what empathy is in, in our field. Uh, 
Rogers talks about at two different levels. The primary level, accurate empathy, which is really letting the client know that you understand what was explicitly expressed. That's, you know, responding to the content. That would include paraphrasing, but there's other techniques for showing that you, that you understand what was said to you. And then advanced accurate empathy, which is uh, a comment on what the client has implied and left unstated as well as what was expressed openly. So, you know, the, in a sense there, you are, you are responding to feelings, but... Um, also, there's underlying content of what the client says sometimes, and so advanced, advanced accurate empathy would also respond to that underlying content. You're kind of bring it to the surface, and, and um, I think it's Hepworth that says to kind of play to the edges of the client's consciousness when you do that. He talks about additive empathy, and that's what I think they're talking about here, you know, that they're playing to the edges of the, of the client's consciousness you know you don't want to go too far you don't want to if you are seeing what's going on with the client and the client yet doesn't understand that you know you don't want to go too far and scare the client away but but just at the edge it helps them their their self-awareness grow i guess you could say um, understanding can be communicated through reflection of feelings and paraphrasing of contents we talked about that earlier um, when you go beyond the explicit, you want to be sure to make your statements tentative. So when you're using this advanced accurate empathy, don't say, hey, you know, don't put it out like they're like, hey, I know what's going on with you. You want to blah, 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 blah. Or you're saying blah, blah, blah. You know, you want to be much more, much more tentative about it. Is it possible that, you know, do I hear you saying it seems to me that that kind of way is, is uh, kind of allows the client to either confirm or deny it? which is the client's right to do. And, and if you're too pushy about it, even if you're not pushy, some, some clients are going to see it as very intrusive or an attempt to control them. And so this isn't something you're going to use necessarily. The, uh, you know, you're going to be empathic regardless, empathetic regardless, but uh, just understand that, that some clients are going to respond to it in ways that you might not expect. And then your nonverbals, a study from long ago also says that those nonverbals communicate empathy as well. And I'm sure you can understand that. The next condition is genuineness. And uh, again, I think Gambrel is the one that pulls warmth into this. But uh, warmth refers to the extent that you communicate non-evaluative, caring, and positive regard for your client. Actually, goes with the third condition but in any event she has it mixed in with genuineness we talked about genuineness a congruence i think earlier is what we referred uh, it was referred to the extent that you are non-defensive that you're real and not phony in exchanges with your clients genuineness implies the capacity to communicate your experience with the client to the client something i was just talking about you know being able to t to share your reaction to the client in the moment more or less uh, that's uh, part of genuineness. Not hiding behind a professional role to speak to protect yourself doesn't mean you should be unprofessional or you know that you want to relate to the client as an uh, you know as an equal and all that. That's not what that's saying. But but not to not to maintain professional aloofness in order to protect yourself from from uh, making a therapeutic connection. Spontaneity. Weighing what is said only when needed and otherwise drawing on skills in a flexible way. You know, just uh, sometimes you have plans for how you're going to go about with your client, you know, what you're going to do with your client and everything like that. And things emerge in, in your meeting with your session with a client and you and you go off in different directions. You know, you're not so rigid. You, you're willing to be flexible. Um, and, and again, you know, responding honestly to what the client is presenting to you. Exploring in a non-aggressive way, uh, being consistent in your words, your feelings, your actions, being able to discuss aspects of the immediate exchange to help the client understand self. Again, these are all part of genuineness. And the third condition was acceptance and positive regard. He referred to it, I believe, as unconditional positive regard. <laughs> Campbell doesn't say unconditional anywhere in her writing, but this is genuine caring for the client. And you are not judging or evaluating a client's thoughts, feelings, or behaviors as good or bad. And each client is accepted and valued for who they are, as they are, without stipulation. So the client has no need to fear judgment or rejection. 
Oh, God, here's a, I'm going to go ahead and fix this right here and now live in front of you there. So imagine this, for instance, just to get a sense of this a little bit. I've, you know, I've worked with, told you this, I've worked with adolescent and adult sex offenders. And um, I know that it's a population that a lot of people, especially um, new persons in, in, you know, in, in this field of study, um, and new practitioners in particular say they well, they just can't work with offenders, the sex offenders especially, you know, batterers and those things. And, and um, as you get more experience and as you, you know, I think learn more about this, you, you find that they're really much more workable than you might imagine. But if you understand uh, what you can and can't do, what we, at least what we believe we can and can't do with them. But in any event, imagine as a therapist, or as a social worker uh, it, intervening in a home where you're trying to make a connection with um, a father who molested his daughter and uh, you're in a position where you ultimately are going to need to convey unconditional positive regard accepting that person for who they are as they are without stipulation think about that now that doesn't mean you're approving the behavior this is an important distinction, of course. You're not approving the behavior. You're not saying it's okay. But you're accepting the individual, that person who did this, what most people think is pretty unspeakable, um, as, as a human being, as somebody who, you know, who wants the same things we want in terms of you know, self-actualization and all those kinds of things. That as a human being who acts based upon things that have occurred in, in his or her life in the past, that there's reasons for those those kinds of things. I mean, that unconditional positive regard sometimes is a is a difficult thing to provide, you know, to your clients. And, but imagine also, if you can, if you're the offender, if you're the client, and you have a worker who provides unconditional positive regard, what that might do if indeed you know, as a client, you're open to intervention. Not always, you know, offenders are not always open to understand that. But those who are, imagine how powerful it would be to have somebody provide that to you when no one else in the world does. I mean, you can understand how how effective that can be in any treatment relationship. If you you know, if you can begin to understand it with something uh, as as difficult as as that kind of treatment relationship can be. So this is a this is a very very important thing. I, you know, if you've studied, uh, I think humanistic psychology, and and um, existentialism, I, the two of them kind of blend together. We we get into this a lot when I, in my men and masculinity class when I taught that course, um, that you know we're raised to be a certain way, and uh, by our parents, you know, males are supposed to be so they're socialized to be you know, traditional masculine things in most homes and females, traditional female things. And, you know, we're supposed to be religious and we're supposed to be this, we're supposed to be that. And then as we grow and, and we try to do those things, we can form. And in the process of doing that, you know, we give up pieces of ourselves in order to receive the love and affection of our parent. Roger said, would say that, that the, those parents are not really giving unconditional positive regard to their children when, when, uh, you know, they have expectations of them to behave in a certain way. And, and the implication is that this is what's going to get my love. Now, most parents wouldn't say it that way. They don't mean it that way. They wouldn't, well, they wouldn't say it to their child that way. But that is the implication sometimes in that interaction between parent and child. And, and um, you know, so that, what was it, the existentialist said that the authentic self is buried in the child as the child grows up trying to win the affection and the love of of his or her parents by giving up parts of self in order to receive you know that love and affection so all this ties into unconditional positive regard essentially it's not something that is easy even for parents to give to kids and we grow up without unconditional positive regard i really think we do most of us you know i uh, those of us who really think we were you know, maybe there are some of us, maybe I'm just talking from my own experience, you know, my parents loved me, but I also knew there were certain things that was expected of me, and they would be very disappointed with me if I, you know, didn't do X, Y, and Z, and as I, as I grew up, and even as an adult, 
you know my brothers are the same way you know we just had a week of family reunion here and and i can still feel as the youngest in that family i can still feel those expectations sometimes of my older brothers as though i was still a 10 year old you know and, and that's that's partly my own issue but but uh, we don't receive unconditional positive regard from most of the people in our lives and so if you can provide that in a ther in a therapeutic relationship whether you're in therapy or out in the field on a home visit or talking to a you know a, somebody in a prison cell if you can provide that just imagine how powerful that is okay i don't mean to spend too much time in this but uh, i i just think this is probably one of the keys is the, the to to uh, establishing you know a positive working relationship with the individual it supports the client and the client's beliefs in themselves and certainly encourages engagement moving on i digress there's a the last this is i think we're getting into the chapter 16 here, you know, the material from chapter 16. No, I'm not. We're still in 15, actually. Um, other other considerations in helping seals, first of all, are verbal behaviors, things to keep in mind. Of course, you always consider cultural differences with, with verbal behaviors, but, you know, the kinds of things that sometimes, uh, if you, have you ever heard uh, Father Michael Alexa talk about cross-cultural communication, he gives a beautiful assessment of of the kinds of verbal behaviors and why it is that Caucasian social workers going into native villages sometimes and, and teachers Caucasian teachers in native villages often communicate the wrong things to native children just by things like their tone of voice and how quickly they talk and those kinds of things because of cultural norms and and that the Caucasian teachers don't don't understand don't know those norms and sometimes communicate things they don't want to communicate with their tone and their pitch and their loudness and those kinds of things if you ever get a chance to I don't even know if that if that uh, those lectures are still out there it was uh, done uh, a series of lectures done at the University of um, of um, Alaska Southeast in the 1990s and I had tapes of them at one time but um, it's one of those things when I I didn't have I don't have a VCR anymore nobody I mean who has VCRs you know not many of us and and when I moved from Alaska I, I tossed all my my tapes and I wished I had kept them but um, it's called um, communicating across cultures it was a series of four lectures just brilliant lectures but these verbal behaviors are something that are very important to keep in mind um, you know, and they have an impact on, on how we communicate. Also, the, the speech oddities, and again, that goes back to my you knows, you knows, and occasionally I know I do the uh, you know, I've, <laughs> there's that you know again. I've heard um, uh, some very disconcerting kind of, of oddities in people's speech patterns when they talk sometimes that just really makes it so hard to listen to them using a lot of those filler words like you know and okay and, and all that type of thing repetitions mispronunciation stammers those types of things sometimes are, are errors in communication now none of us are perfect and we're not linguists and so we're going to have a lot of imperfections in our in our approach with clients but we just need to be aware that these things do have an impact sometimes and uh, watching a, a videotape of myself one time in a training session it was pointed out to me that I had a tendency to push my glasses up on my nose a lot when I was talking to somebody, probably because, you know, the stress of the situation being taped when I was videotaping somebody caused, caused me to, you know, perspire a little. My glass kept, glasses kept slipping down my nose, maybe. So that's something that can be really troublesome to people to see you keep pushing your glasses up. So I learned to try to manage that some. Nonverbal behaviors reflect status differences sometimes, and it's something, something to keep in mind. You know, like they mentioned about gender socialization patterns and how we judge each other based on certain things that maybe don't really go with our gender. And they, uh, traditional socialization patterns, he mentions females. You know, the females are going to smile more, they're more polite, they're more accommodating, can be seen as a sign of weakness. But that isn't those those patterns aren't true in all cultures and so when we see individuals from other cultures that don't feel the kinds of things that you know if we're Caucasian and we're used to then that communicates things to us that probably are not valid 
You want to make sure your verbal and nonverbal behaviors are congruent as much as possible. Watch your facial expressions. Keep again keeping cultural conditions in mind and gazing, the gaze avoidance, you know, that whether you make eye contact with a person I residential program that I had a lot of interaction with, one of the things that they required of, of their children was that the kids make eye contact with the person when they're being corrected because that communicates that they're listening and it communicates respect. But for Alaskan, and there were a lot of Alaska natives there, it really, making eye contact was the precise opposite. It, uh, you know, in, in, at least in the cultures that we were interacting with in, in Kenai, uh, eye contact was a sign of, direct eye contact was a sign of disrespect, in fact. In our culture, we think that it, it uh, adds emphasis to our speech and, and, and um, you know, that it shows that people are listening to us, but uh, it doesn't mean that same in other cultures. Posture and position, uh, proximity, that is certainly something that, you know, that sort of that personal bubble is bigger or larger depending upon the nature of the relationship you have. I mean, if you're in an intimate relationship, your personal bubble is much smaller than if you're in a professional relationship. And and I think uh, in most uh, social interactions, the, the proper distance in this is again this is white mainstream culture is is arm's length pretty much um, and then closer makes people uncomfortable in general now like i said other cultures see that very differently gestures you know the, every culture has uh, its own kind of gestures and things and and uh, sometimes the things that gestures what gestures mean in our culture isn't the same as what it means in other cultures touch Again, this is a this is, there's a paragraph in here about touching clients where I think Gambrel just kind of just doesn't even talk about the some of the implications about touch and particularly in the more recent times with the Me Too movement and different kinds of things like that. I was trained years ago and and that in in supervision training to and I mean it was put this way to never touch my employees. Uh, even if I had an employee sitting at his or her desk, head in arms, crying over something, not even to touch their shoulders to express sympathy because, or comfort, because that means different things to different people in different situations and it can be read the wrong way. And um, I don't know that I really, really like that directive. I understand where it's coming from. And there have been times, you know, where uh, I've had superiors walk up behind me and just kind of squeeze my shoulders you know because they knew I was tense and it was a very positive experience for me but in other situations with other people it might not have been uh, and so you have to be very careful when you're talking about co-workers and, and, and employees certainly but also especially with your clients and uh, my the woman who trained me in working with doing social work with children said to never touch your child clients early in the relationship even upon greeting them don't insist upon them shaking your hands because they sexual sexually abused children have had their personal space violated and the only way you can respect that with a with a child that doesn't know you is to not touch them to let them keep their own space and the integrity of their own physical presence and and um, I think perhaps over time you know that can be relax some as the child becomes more comfortable with you but uh, we need to be very cautious about touching our profession and there are some people who believe that you know that hugs and and those kinds of things are very therapeutic and I, I suppose there, there there is some therapeutic value to that in some situations with some clients in some circumstances but in a general rule, you know, I, I think our, our code of ethics is, is addressing this now as well, you know, that it's something that we need to be very cautious about and um, really recommend that you don't really don't do the touchy feely thing with your clients much at all. Uh, and, and again, I'm, I'm a little surprised that Gambrel doesn't really talk about that more. So just be aware that it, as you read that paragraph, I'm, I, I would uh, I would write it differently. Okay. Be assertive. It's not, now we're getting into the last chapter here. It's possible that you've grown up in a culture that discouraged questioning authority. I think one of our 
discussion board questions uh, raised that issue and uh, some of you related to that and some of you did not I and mean, I think it's great that some of you were raised to to challenge authority in your life it really is good but uh, you know that's not the case for a lot of us and, and helping clients at times obligates us to be able to question uh, our superiors policy programs practices and those kinds of things and it's, it's a very uncomfortable thing for many people so we want to develop those skills for interacting with our administrators that help us in to avoid predicaments and also to get the training that we need to have you know that's another thing sometimes we have to insist upon training for certain certain things that we're expected to do but in doing this and this is important don't undermine their authority uh, know how to build a case for change and recognize the power dynamics and the norms in your organization i have had employees who have tremendously great insight and everybody that knows those employees acknowledges that what they say is true but their approach in bringing that across was very abrasive and consistently abrasive and what happened is the uh, superiors would not listen to those people they absolutely shut them out and in fact they joked about them behind their back um, and laughed about their tech their technique and their style and all that and, and the sad part of it is, is that, that those important messages that those individuals had to convey didn't get conveyed to the important people. And, and it's, it's, it goes back to taking responsibility uh, to ensure that you're conveying uh, what you want to convey, that you're communicating in a way that your listener can understand, that they can hear you. And if you're assaulting and attacking, this goes for administrators, if you're attacking the only human response that's natural to that is to defend. And when an individual is defending, they're thinking about their next, their response to that or how they're going to defend that off. They're not really thinking about listening to what's being said. Okay. When you have questions, when you want to raise questions or disagree, there's some ways to go about that in healthy fashion. Uh, first of all be sure you understand the problem before you criticize it uh, and again if your style of expression doesn't offend others they're going to listen to you they're more likely to listen to you look for points of agreement because that and, and emphasize that because that really tends to decrease defensive reactions on the other side acknowledge the other person's views uh, when you are t raising questions be tactful and raise them at an appropriate time don't question and challenge people necessarily in front of others you know that that tends to put people on the defensive keeping cultural norms in mind at all times take responsibility for your points with I statements as much as possible don't be blaming others with your with you statements avoid put downs these are these are basic uh, you know basic communication th skills that I just put it in a chapter here because we all have to deal with this, these things sometimes in in uh, our work settings and we forget these things when you're getting criticized by others it can be difficult this can be your co-workers in a case staffing it could be your superior or super supervisor during your supervision sessions uh, could be a member of the public criticizing what you've done it might be your client confronting you about something recognize that uh, that uh, sometimes criticism may come across as an honest attempt at problem solving but also might look like somebody's just blowing off steam or teasing you sometimes there's a sort of a passive aggressive way of of criticizing also where the individual makes some comments that are sort of sarcastic it's not so much teasing as sarcastic and their criticism is implied in that but they the other side, the other, the person providing the criticism, let's say, looking at it, the other side isn't helpful here. <laughs> the other person uh, who's generating the criticism is not taking responsibility for what they're trying to say, so they disguise it. And, you know, I think we all know about that. And and the thing to do with that, and they're talking about this also with teasing, teasing is to bring it into the open, discuss it, identify it. And, and again, in, in a non-hostile way, but just bring that subject up into the open and, and bring it out for discussion. And sometimes that diffuses this uh, passive aggressive uh, kind of or aggressive way of, of uh, criticizing, being criticized. 
try to respond constructively to criticism. Don't withdraw from the person. Don't attack. Don't defend. Those are very hard things to do. Because again, you know, most of us have been raised to believe that we have to be right. That it's that it's bad to make a mistake. It's just not good to be wrong. Feedback is a chance to learn to identify your flaws. So, so listen to what is being said. Watch the verbals and nonverbals. Be emp empathetic or empathic as much as you can, um, and accept responsibility if the criticism is sound. And ask for or offer solutions if the criticism is sound. But don't tolerate verbal abuse. Th That's another thing. Being criticized is one thing, or accepting criticism is one thing. But if a person becomes verbally abusive, put a stop to that. Just let them know you don't you won't accept verbal abuse and and um, that nobody nobody should be putting up with that if you have to make requests of others sometimes those other people can see this criticism so be be conscious of that and there again there are some techniques that that are mentioned in this chapter that uh, um, will help you make those requests in ways that other people can can hear them and, and respond to them for one thing, if somebody's doing something that is troubling, uh, disturbing you or disturbing other people in in the relationship you're observing or whatever it might be, don't assume that people understand it because a lot of times they don't know that. And so you can kind of take this as an opportunity of, of <laughs> consciousness raising or educating perhaps with that individual. And and the other thing with, with making requests is, you know, get away from this concept of winning. Um, and, and lead towards reaching a mutually acceptable solution by considering the other person's views as well. It isn't that you have to come out on top when you make a request. It's that you, know, you want to change behaviors. Don't spring these requests. Um, if, it, if it's something that's going to you know, be significant, don't just spring it on somebody. And let them know that there's an issue you want to talk about uh, and you know, decide when you're going to talk about it and where. It's, it's good to give persons, uh, individuals, an opportunity to kind of think things over a little bit. Don't kill them with too many things. Limit it to one or two areas. Use I statements, not you statements. You statements are blaming, you know. So so try to keep you out of your statements altogether, you know. Uh, and here's a here's a couple formats for that. No shoulds, oughts, those kinds of things. Don't be judgmental. Make your request in a manner that matches the message. Uh, the one program we used to use in parent education uh, said don't undershoot. Uh, if you're upset with something, be sure that you say that you're upset. Again, not in a way that, 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 that threatens or assaults the other person, but let them know that you're upset about something, you're angry about something. Don't just say it troubles me a little bit. And the last point, you know, which is sometimes ask yourself if it really matters or if, if the change is even possible that you're looking for. And sometimes the best thing is just to stay silent. But again, to be assertive, oftentimes you need to make requests. And, and by all means, you should do that in a proper way if you find yourself being troubled by things. We're almost done here. Dealing with put downs. Um, and, and this is an important thing, I think, both as a uh, giver and a receiver in put down, so to speak, is is that these put downs are defined by their function, not their form. And it's the same thing as um, um, you know oppressions and and um, that kind of thing. You know, it really how it impacts the individual is what's most important. It isn't what you intend. So the debate about, for instance. Um, say the debate about the name of the Washington Redskins there's something that inspires a lot of passion I don't quite understand but but uh, people don't get that uh, Redskins is you know is generally associated as a derogatory term for Native Americans and and so many people just don't catch that and they feel like they have an ownership to the right to that and they don't recognize what it means to Native Americans to you know to have that term bantied about same thing with the Confederate statues and African Americans. That what what the what the meaning of those things are. Um, it, it, it what's important is what the receiver hears, not what you intend in a statement. 
try to avoid responding in kind. And if if you hear somebody, you know, a put down of a group, let's say, or of an individual because of their participation in a group, make sure that they understand you don't accept stereotypes. Emotional abuse, bullying, sexual harassment, you know, this is a, this is a whole seminar in and of itself. But uh, in, in a few lines, you know, there, I mean, here's sexual harassment, discrimination on the grounds of gender, race, age, sexual orientation, pregnancy, or disability is not legal and should never be tolerated. And the Code of, uh, code of Ethics prohibits workers from sexual harassment of um, supervisees, students, trainees, and colleagues. Gambrel is talking about the workplace here. Of course, this also applies to, you know, any kind of uh, sexual harassment of clients as well. If, if you're the object of, I guess it's object, of, of sexual overtures or sexual harassment statements, communicate clearly that you don't accept that, communicate a clear no, and if, if those things persist, of course, you should, re well, you should. A formal complaint could be filed. It's really up to you. Finally, <laughs> a couple closing thoughts. For one thing, uh, I want to drop to the bottom thing first with safety uh, in field. You know, it's an issue in field settings. I, I did a training once or twice when uh, before the training academy was established on safety in home visits, and, and I, 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 I have that material somewhere, I just don't know where it is, but there are some very concrete things you can do on home visits to, you're not going to guarantee your safety in a home visit, you know, but, but uh, I mean, there are situations, you know, from time to time where social workers actually are killed on home visits. They're very rare. I don't want that to scare you away from the work. But but safety in home visits is something that's, you know, something we really need to pay attention to. And and so, you know, they some of the things they suggest is to keep your shoes on in the house, you know. Uh, be aware of where, where the door is and try to <clears throat> try to be between the door and your client if at all possible, if you think there's a possibility of danger. Um, you know, some basic kinds of things like that how to make sure that there's no weapons laying around that that might be used if you have a volatile client now again that doesn't apply to every home visit please understand this that in in the office settings of course safety is becoming an increasing issue in this day and age and and um, if there's i just had in fact i one of my friends just commented she works uh, for a local, well, university, uh, well, University of Michigan, <laughs> and she she works in um, some sort of student services capacity. I'm not sure exactly what she does, but <clears throat> she her students aren't always happy with what she has to do, and 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 in her office, and so they had they had workplace safety training, you know, being shown. For instance, you know, what you can use as weapons if you need to and how to respond if somebody becomes aggressive and those kinds of things. I mean, this is something that is a good thing to have training on. And I would ask if, if um, well, if, if you're in the field, you know, find out about getting trained on office safety. I mean, not not making sure that, and that's what office safety usually means in bureaucracies. Oh, there's an extension cord someone might trip over, or make sure you close the file cabinet drawer because somebody might bump into it. You know, that's what office safety has meant over the years. But we're talking about human safety in, in an office setting now. And uh, I, I would ask about that and whether there's going to be training or not. And the same thing with home visits. These are these are things to keep in mind. They uh, talked about a lot about how you arrange your office. So, unfortunately, uh, some some uh, some facilities now you don't have offices. You know you're you're interviewing people in interview rooms and things like this. And so we're talking again about clients that are potentially hostile or aggressive. Leave the door open if you can. If you can't do that because of confidentiality, make sure that your chair is between the client at the door so that you know you can get to the door before the client or that the client can't block you from getting to the door um, I always uh, had my desk turned against the wall uh, some people like to keep that desk that that uh, boundary between you um, but while on one hand that might help you with an aggressive client on the other hand it also enables the aggressive client to block your exit so depending upon your 
office and, and those kinds of things. So these are all things to just keep in mind as you um, if you have a client who's getting upset. One of the things that I found personally that helped is why don't you sit down, have them sit, try to have them sit down because that helps to calm them some. And particularly if you stay seated as well when they're up and if you get up, you know, that that uh, increases the likelihood of something happening between the two of you. So so, you know, in the field, keep a cell phone with you at all times. Uh, you know, use your active listening skills, use empathy, address the feelings the clients are are. Um, expressing don't take them anger personally respect the client's personal space those kinds of things these are all good things and and again you know that's a whole workshop that's a whole couple workshops and and i'm just introducing this topic to you and i'm going to encourage you to if you're in, in an administrative capacity i would say by all means you know set up some training with with whether it's law enforcement or somebody who does it set up some training for for safety how to respond to shooters and and angry clients mental health center i worked in had a code i never heard it used but uh, they had an intercom system through the phones and it was dr armstrong so uh, dr armstrong the bill's office please was the code to get everybody to come to my place because i had somebody who was threatening me you know we had uh, emergency buttons put on our desk that the, that rang the receptionist to call the police department. I would have liked to see that ring directly to the police department, but but again, for emergency purposes and those kind, of, there are things that can be done, you know, to to really make the office more safe. And so I think uh, a good assessment of of office safety is one thing. A good assessment of how your uh, staff are arranging their offices and whether they're, it's easy for somebody to block them in or not. All those kinds of things. Uh, and if you don't know how to do that, get somebody in that can look for those things and train your office staff in this stuff. If you're a worker, I would encourage you to talk to your administrator about having uh, training for safety both in the office and in the field. And the other, the other thing in this final slide is about speaking up in case conferences. And uh, not to belabor this point, but, you know, again, we, we have been raised to see, uh, to want to be perfect and to not make mistakes and uh, to not have to tell people that, that I'm not effective in this situation. And yet uh, the, the value, and I saw this time and time again in, in my work over the years, no matter what setting I was in, the more people got together and shared their cases and talked about the troubles they're having with their clients with each other, the more support they got from their coworkers and the better, the more effective they were. They learned things from their coworkers and they feel uh, that they can turn to coworkers for support. I, I don't know where I just said this to you somewhere. I, I think it's in the other, it's probably in the other lecture, but don't, don't, uh, don't expect the office to be the source of your emotional support. And this is one mistake I've seen in some some settings where I've supervised that that uh, in stressful settings, you know, the staff sometimes they form these kind of cliques and they're like each other's emotional support and and they even exclude other people because, you know, they, they understand each other better than the rest or whatever. But but the office is not the place for you to get your emotional support. You have family, you have friends, you have, uh, I don't know, if you go to church, maybe your church community or your social group, your whatever it is, you know, wherever you get your emotional support, it should not, you shouldn't expect that to be from your supervisor and your coworkers. That doesn't mean that your supervisor, your coworkers aren't interested in you or that you shouldn't share personal things with them because you should, you should connect as human beings, but, but don't require that to be the support for you, your support system, because that's not the right place. You're there to achieve some things uh, first and foremost, but you can provide each other with professional support through sharing of cases and talking over things and being honest with each other and in, in, in case conferences and, and be willing to listen to what people say about it. So, okay, that's enough of that. I got to down off my soapbox now. We all make mistakes. And, and if you think that we shouldn't make mistakes, it's going to get in the way of you raising questions that you need to raise to benefit your client. So keep that in mind. Okay, that's it for this this one. Um, hope you found some things useful here and we'll be talking again soon. Bye for now.